Welcome to First Baptist Church of Clinard, where we're developing dynamic disciples. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden online worship experience. We are so excited that you're worshiping with us. We thank you, Pastor Jenkins, thank you, and the leadership and the FBCG family. Now, please let us know where you're worshiping from in the chat area. You just type that in and we can acknowledge you. At this point, let us prepare our hearts for praise and worship. Right where you are, just put your hands together. Let's have a little fun.
in Jesus' name, the name that heals, the name that fights for you. Amen. Now it is time for our scripture reading. I am Reverend Norman Thomas. Again, I'm honored to be your presider today. Before we get into the scripture reading, I'd like to ask if you have a neighbor or a friend or even someone in your home, ask them to join you on this worship service. I'm pretty sure they would greatly appreciate it. Our scripture reading today will come from the book of Jeremiah, and we're going to look at chapter 17, verses 9 and 10. I will be reading from the King James Version, so you can follow along easily if you like, or on the screen. Again, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, verses 9 and 10. And the word of God reads, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. The word of the Lord is truly blessed. Join me in prayer. Gracious Father, sovereign Lord, and righteous King, how we thank you, Lord God, for this blessed day. It is you, Lord God, and your loving hand that ushered us into another precious day. We thank you, Lord God, for covering us and giving us safety through the night, allowing us to see a day that was not promised. Father, we pray that as we enter into this time of worship that your spirit will arrest our hearts and allow us to hear from you through your servant. Father, we know that we're facing troubled times, but you're a God who redeems, you're a God who provides, you're a God who sustains. And so, Father, we ask that you have your way in our lives today. Touch the hearts of those in each and every area that we're experiencing, that, that's experiencing this worship service. Let them experience you right in their homes, in their cars, in their offices, wherever they may be at this point in time. And Father, we ask that we will continue to give you glory. Strengthen our shepherd today, Pastor John K. Jenkins, as he delivers a rhema word to change the hearts of those who are hardened. We thank you, Lord God, for your loving kindness and your presence. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, let us take a look at what's happening around FBCG through our active news. This is FBCG News for the week of August 2nd. Your source for the latest news and information at First Baptist Church of Glen Arden, where we're developing dynamic disciples. Due to county restrictions, the movie night has been canceled. All who have purchased tickets will be refunded. We hope to reschedule in the future. On Saturday, August 8th at 10 a.m., help us recognize and celebrate the graduates of our 11 discipleship programs during the virtual 2020 Joint Discipleship Graduation. For up to 10 months, these men and women demonstrated their commitment by learning and growing through challenging discipleship curriculums. To view the graduation, join us online at fbcglenarden.org slash watch now or on Facebook Live. Visit the church website to learn more about these life-changing ministries. Online registration for the Institute's virtual fall session is open now until Tuesday, September 8th. Classes start on Sunday, September 13th. Don't delay. Take advantage of the many classes available to help you become a true disciple in all areas of life, like effective communication, financial freedom too, and singles only marriage 411. Visit fbcglenarden.org slash the institutes to register. That's the news for this week. You can find more details about these and other events at fbcglenarden.org. Please take a, a moment and join us as we prepare to celebrate all of the candidates who are part of the discipleship graduation. What a wonderful time to see all of the hard work and dedication that these servants, these people who love the Lord has put in. And as the Institute ramp up, Get ready for the fall season to be a part of the Bible Institute and learn how to get closer to God through learning his word. Now, I did ask that you check in um, uh, through the chat line to let us know where you're uh, dialing in from. And we're happy to, to reach out to uh, Luckland, Florida. Thank you for checking in. For Martinburg, West Virginia, we, we thank you for checking in. Valley Stream, New York. Hey, thank you for checking in with us. And also Houston, Texas, and many others. We truly thank you for being a part of our worship experience. Now it is time to talk about our tithes and offerings. What you have been doing for, 
First Baptist Church Glen Arden and around the world through your tithes and offerings is feeding people, strengthening people, and helping the Word of God go forth. So far, we've prepared over 8,000 bags of food to meet the needs of the people, not only in this community, but abroad. Your giving does so much to help save lives. So we thank you. You can look at the bottom of the screen and there's a number there where you can give or you can go online and give anytime during the day, the week or the month as the Lord moves you. Amen. Let us pray at this moment. Precious Lord, we thank you that you trust us so much that you allow us to receive the blessings that come from your hand and you allow us to give back to you just a small portion of what you've given us. Lord, we know that we cannot beat you in giving. So, Father, we ask that you receive these tithes and these offerings that it may be a blessing to you and that it may continue to further the kingdom of heaven here on earth. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts for another song from Praise and Worship.
not be beside I will always worship you as long as I am free I always worship you Wow, praise God. All of our worship, all of my worship. He's worthy to be praised and glorified. And we give God the glory and the honor. And I hope that you've extended your worship to God this morning, this day, this evening, whatever time you're viewing this broadcast today. I pray that you are extending worship to the Almighty God. He's worthy of our praise and worthy of our glory and worthy of us honoring him and blessing his name. So thank you for joining us wherever you are in the world. And I know that people join us from all over the world and I'm honored and grateful for your presence today. We're gonna to get into a heavy word in just a few moments, but before we dive into it, we always like to begin our time together in prayer. And we're always praying and interceding for lost souls and unsaved people. We're always interceding and believing God to transform some life, to bring a change into someone's life. And I want to ask you to pause with me for just a moment before we dive into this word today. And I want to pray that God would, uh, we would cry out to God for the salvation of lost souls. Let's, let's pray. Father, we give you the glory and the honor and the praise on this glorious day. Thank you for your loving kindness, your tender mercies that you have extended to us. You have given us what we have not deserved or earned. We pray and intercede and give you thanks for salvation and deliverance and breakthroughs and miracles that you extend our way. As we come before you today, we're praying for your perfect will to be done in our lives. But we also are praying specifically today for your will to be done in the lives of people that we know don't know you or people who've strayed from you, people who are unsure of their eternal status. We're praying, God, for your perfect will to be done in the lives of those who have been disconnected from your kingdom, from the house of God and the people of God. We pray that you draw them and restore them and save them and redeem them as only you can, almighty God. I pray today, and I'm interceding in the midst of this pandemic, Father, that you would meet needs. We're praying today that you would put food on the table and provisions and protection around the lives of, of the people of God. We're praying, God, for homes and families, that you would step into the domain of their circumstance and grant them what they stand in the need of in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, we pray and intercede and confess our sins to you, acknowledge our transgressions, and we give you praise that the blood of Jesus has covered us and washed us and that we have the ability to have a relationship with you through the Lord Jesus by the blood that he has shed on Calvary's cross. And we do not take it for granted that his blood was shed, that we could be redeemed and have a walk with you. And we give you the praise. And Father, we, uh, we pray as well today for you to uh, put a shield around us. I pray for a shield around this message and this word. I'm praying a shield around our homes and around our families and around our ministries. 
We're praying today, Heavenly Father, that you would protect us from the evil one, deliver us from evil, from the plots and schemes of the enemy. Uh, give us deliverance in the name of Jesus. And when it's all said and done, it is our prayer, Almighty God, that your kingdom, your name would be exalted and glorified. And I want to pray today, Father, that you would anoint us for these next few moments to be your mouthpiece and your instrument and your conduit, Father, to, to convey your message. Anoint particularly this message today. I know it's a tough word, Father, but I pray today that hearts would be open and receptive and that you would accomplish in the lives of your people what you desire in the precious name of the Lord Jesus, we pray and we give thanks. Amen and amen. Praise him. All righty. God bless you today. Let me ask you to open your Bibles. You got to open your Bibles today because I'm going to be going through a lengthy passage of Scripture. Second Samuel chapter 13. Second Samuel chapter 13. This is a, it's a it's a message. It's a story. Uh, matter of fact, it's one of those stories that is full of drama in the Bible. It's full of drama, full of circumstances and situations that you, you might find a, a, a shock to see in the Bible, but yet it's in the Bible. And uh, I'm going to be walking down through these first 19 verses of chapter 13 of 2 Samuel. And what I want to talk about today is one of the underreported crimes, most dis undiscussed matter. Until recently, it's been a secret. It has not been often talked about. And I want to talk to you today about abuse. I know there's a lot of different abuse. There's verbal abuse, emotional abu abuse, phys psychological abuse, physical abuse. But this is a story about sexual abuse. And that's what I want to talk to you today. It's about sexual abuse. And it is a story about a, uh, a young man who violated his sister. Let's read this story. Let me walk with me. And I want to I want to talk about this because it's not talked about often in the church. It is not discussed frequently in the kingdom of God or even in the world. It's not discussed uh, often. Recently, though, the Me Too, the Me Too movement has brought it to light, has exposed it. And many, many are coming out of the uh, coming out of their pain and out of their circumstances to acknowledge that they too have been violated sexually. And I think the church should talk about it as well. So I want to spend a few moments and talk about it. And I want to talk about it from this story of a young man named Absalom. And I, I want to point out several things as we walk through these 19th verses of 2 Samuel chapter 13. Here's what verse beginning at verse 1. It says this. After this, Absalom, the son of David, had a lovely sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Amnon was so distressed over his sister Tamar that he became sick, for he was a virgin, for she was a virgin. And it was improper for Amnon to do anything to her. Amnon, here he is, the son, one of David's, uh, one of the sons of David. Here it was that he uh, wanted something that was forbidden to him. He was, he was enthralled and infatuated with his sister, Tamar. And the Bible teaches us that he allowed these passions of his flesh to put him in a sick condition. He, he was so infatuated and so so much wanted his sister that the scripture says he became ill. His passion for her, his burden for her became so powerful that he became sick. He wanted to sleep with his sister. And let me tell you something. You are a sick person when every female you look at or somebody that you shouldn't desire becomes a passionate desire of yours. And this man was not just sick physically. He was sick psychologically. He was sick emotionally something's wrong when you want something that you shouldn't have he was a sick man and the potential for you and I to make a human being that we ought to look at in one way become the object of our sexual desires is a sick thing and that was Amnon's problem most victims of domestic violence or sexual uh, abuse 
happened when they were violated by somebody that they knew. Tamar knew Amnon and Amnon knew Tamar. And, and most, unfortunately, most people who are victims of this have, has it happened to them by virtue of somebody that they're related to or somebody that's close to their family, somebody that they know. And this was the case here. So many people have been uh, victimized. But here's the deal that the scripture tells us right here that it was improper, verse 2, for Amnon to have Im an immoral relationship with his own sister. And so if I was going to give you a point today, my first point here today is that God has established boundaries, restrictions. We live in a culture where people don't want boundaries. They don't want restrictions. They don't want to have limitations and boundaries on what they can have and what they can't have. But the truth of the matter is God has established boundaries, restrictions. I think it's a burden that you and I must learn as a part of our life to respect and honor the boundaries that God has established. That's what the purpose of the commands are. That's what the purpose of the scriptures are, are to tell us what God's boundaries are. And that we ought not cross those boundaries. We ought not violate those boundaries. We ought, we ought not ignore those boundaries. When you cross over those boundaries, there are consequences. We don't want to think that there are consequences. We don't want to believe or embrace the fact that something happens when you cross those boundaries. But Amnon, unfortunately, wanted to do something that it was known he should not do. It was known, it was stated, and he wanted to cross those established boundaries that God has created. You and I have boundaries, and guess what? Our flesh always wants to go down the path to do something that God said don't do. But the encouragement from our master today is honor the boundaries that he's established. But the story doesn't end there. He, he got so sick because of his fleshly desires but look, here's an, uh, let, let's pick up at verse 3 with this story. It says, but, verse thir 3, but Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shemiah, David's brother. Now, Jonadab, Jonadab was a very crafty man. And he said to him, why are you, the king's son, becoming thinner day by day, day after day? Will you not tell me? Amnon said to him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Y'all see that? Now, now it's his, his brother's sister. <laughs> okay, that's another discussion. So, so Jonadab said to him, lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. And when your father comes to see you, say to him, please let my sister Tamar come and give me food. And prepare the food in my sight that I may see it and eat it from her hand. Get the picture. He, he finds himself listening to the advice of a so-called friend. And his friend, his friend wrongly influenced him and convinced him and persuaded him to come up with a plot and a scheme to do something that was immoral. And I think we ought to talk about this because he, he, along with his friend, plotted and schemed for him to violate his sister. And I want, I, I think it's important for you and I to recognize who are the people that we hang out with. Here, here's, here's the problem. He's hanging out with somebody who's giving him bad advice. And you and I need, need to be careful. As a matter of fact, he, here's my second warning to you, that your friendships and your relationships matter. You need to have friendships and relationships that are going to urge you to make righteous choices, even when you want to do something that's not righteous. Everybody needs to take an evaluation of who your friends are. Who are the people that you relate to? Who are the people that you talk to? Who are the people that influence you to make choices and decisions? Everybody who wants to please God needs to have relationships of people who will urge you to make righteous choices. 
No man was created to be an island. God did not create you to operate in an isolated way by yourself. That's number one. Nobody's called to be alone, but also everybody must be careful who you connect with as your friends. I want the kind of friends in my life that when I'm thinking about doing the wrong thing, they'll challenge me to do the right thing. Those are the kind of people I want in my life. I want people in my life who when I'm thinking down the wrong path, when I'm considering unrighteous things, I don't want them to encourage me and tell me it's going to be OK. You and I need to evaluate our friends. And yes, it's OK to get some people out of your life. If you've got some people in your life that are not challenging you to make righteous choices, you've got bad friends. But be rest assured of this. Be, be confident of this. They are either influencing you or you are influencing them. The truth of the matter is some of us have some things going on and swirling around in our minds and in our hearts that we're pondering and considering and giving weight to. And the reality of the fact is you need some people surrounding you in your life who will give you the right kind of suggestions and challenge. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, jot that verse down. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33 says this, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Don't be deceived. The people you hang out with, evil company corrupts good behavior. The people who you surround yourself with will either encourage you, challenge you, say the right thing to you or encourage you to go on the wrong path. And Amnon finds himself listening to somebody who doesn't give him sound advice. They come up with a plot and a scheme to deceive. As a matter of fact, let me pick up this verse, verse six. It says this, then Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. And when the king, when the king came to see him, Amnon said to the king, please, let Tamar, my sister, come and make a couple of cakes for me in my sight that I may eat from her hand. And David sent home to Tamar, saying, now go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. The king, the, the father, gave Tamar the instructions, go to your brother's house and fix a meal for him and feed him. Verse 8 says, so Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house and he was lying there. Then she took flour and kneaded it, made cakes in his sight and baked the cakes. Amnon plotted to deceive his father and his sister. He lied to his daddy and his sister. He lied and many, let me tell you something, many people who have the wrong intentions will plot a lie or a scheme to defeat you. Their behavior reveals their true motives. Late night phone calls, secret rendezvous, secret relationships. There was no fault or deceit on Tamar's fault. She didn't do anything wrong. She honored what her father asked her to do. She walked down the right path. She made a righteous choice. She obeyed her father and she served. She went to serve her sick brother Amnon. But here's the deal. Here's my third point that I want to make about this. Deception is an indication of immoral motives or an immoral heart. Deception. Now, why do I tell you that? I tell you that because no, no person can determine what's in your heart, but you have to determine what's in your heart. Nobody else. There is no spiritual gift to go in and look at what's in a person's heart. What's their motive? Nobody can determine that. But you have to determine it for yourself. You have to determine what's the real reason I'm asking or doing what it is I'm doing. And here what I think is important. The scripture is crystal clear. Proverbs 618. Jot it down. Proverbs 618 says that the heart uh, 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 devises wicked plans. The heart comes up with a plan that's not righteous and not holy and not pleasing in the sight of God. Jeremiah 17, 9, the text that uh, Reverend Thomas read today says that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Your heart will play tricks on you and make you think that something is right when it's not right. All of us have to weigh and evaluate our heart. And how do you know when your heart's not right? When it comes up with a deceitful plan. 
That's one of the indications that you're headed in the wrong direction. When you have to lie about it, when you have to sneak around, when you have to maintain a secret, when there's some things you can't talk about. That's the, that is the wickedness of the heart. Your, your heart and my heart cannot be trusted. It will lead us down a path. And when you find deception in the play, when you find deception in the scheme, you can rest assured that your heart is plotting to do something that's wicked. And that was unfortunately Amnon's situation, that he allowed his heart to walk down a path of deceiving his father and deceiving his sister. He is laying up in the bed acting like him is sick, acting like he got an illness all for the purpose of reason of defiling his sister. Rest assured that so much defilement has gone on with somebody behaving deceptively. In verse 9, it says this, and she took the, the pan and placed them out before him, but he refused to eat. Then Amnon said, have everyone go out from me. And they all went out from him. He kicked everybody out the room. Then Ammon said to Tamar, bring the food into the bedroom that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them to Amnon, her brother, in the bedroom. Now, when she had brought them to him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, come Lie with me, my sister. But she answered him, no, my brother, do not force me. For no such thing should be done in Israel. Do not do this disgraceful thing. And I, where could I take my shame? And as for you, you would be like one of the fools in Israel. Now, therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. However, he would not heed her voice. And being stronger than she, he forced her and lay with her. He forced himself on his sister. He forced himself. She made an appeal. She said, ask, your, ask daddy. Because she knew her father would not allow him to violate his own sister. She knew that. She knew her father would look out for her and protect her. But he forced himself and many women. I want to talk for just a moment about the many of, of people, men and women, by the way, who have been forced, had themselves, somebody forced themselves upon them. And for so many of you, unfortunately, you, you've carried the guilt and the shame. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. But I want to challenge those who have forced themselves upon somebody else. That's not appealing. That's not godly. That's not the will of God. You never, ever, here's point four, it is never right to force yourself upon another person. Never is it right to force yourself on another person. In any way, any form, any fashion, is it ever proper to force yourself or some action or some behavior or some act upon somebody else, it's wicked. It is ungodly. The modern day Me Too movement is speaking out loud finally, thank God. And people are being exposed who have done this for decades. And I wanna say to you, it's wrong for you to force yourself. And I wanna say to every person, never allow anybody to force themselves upon you. Have the bold, the courageousness. It's never right to do that. Nothing makes it okay. It doesn't matter what your position, what your posture, how much power you have, what authority you have. It's never proper to force yourself on another person. I don't care who you are. But yet Amnon forced himself. He forced himself. It's, it's sickening to think that you would derive pleasure from forcing yourself on somebody. Amen to the Me Too movement who are now speaking out loudly about the many, many people who have been violated in this way. Verses 15 through 19, it says this, then Amnon hated her exceedingly so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, arise, be gone. Now that he got what he wanted, he rejects her. 
Now that he did what he wanted to do, he further abuses her by rejecting her. Verse 16. So she said to him, no, indeed, the evil of sending me away is worse than the other that you did to me. But he would not listen to her. Then he called his servants who attended him and said, here, put this woman out away from me and bolt the door behind her. Now she had on a robe of many colors for the king's virgin daughters wore such apparel. And his servant put her out and bolted the door behind her. Then Tamar put ashes on her head and tore her robe of many colors that was on her and laid her hand on her head and wept and went away crying bitterly. She felt rejected and shame. This is the normal behavior, posture and, 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 and re response of a person who's been violated. They carry a sense of rejection and shame. And many of them feel as though they have done something that facilitated this abuse. But I want to say to every person who's been abused it is not your fault. Don't you pick up that shame. Don't let the enemy beat you up to make you feel as though you are somehow responsible. It is never proper for anyone under any circumstances to force themselves upon you. It is the tragedy, the sadness, the pain it makes my heart bleed. When I hear about story after story after story, as I have counseled woman after woman after woman and some men who have had themselves violated by some wicked person. I want to say to you, don't allow others bad behavior to make you feel as though you're the cause to violate you. I think this is an important point I want to make today, because when somebody violates you, you need to understand this to every person who's been violated. Let me say this to you. The way God formed us and the way God made us, we are a triune being. We are body, soul and spirit. What you see of me is my body, the external part of a house that I live in. It is the external home that the real me lives in. My soul lives in this body. My soul includes my mind, my will my emotions. And then there's yet an innermost inner part of me, an inner uh, inner chamber, the spirit person, the spirit that gives me life, the spirit that the Holy Spirit connects with, that gives me the vibrancy of life that I have. And I want to say to you today that if somebody has violated you externally, if they have violated your body, you control whether they violate your soul and your spirit. And I want to say to you today, if you've been violated, if you've been abused, stop the violation at the external point. Let, let say, say you violated me externally. You violated my body, but I'm not going to let you violate my heart. I'm not going to let you violate my soul. I'm not going to let you violate my mind. I'm not going to let you violate my spirit. When you let them violate your spirit, you become bitter and angry and upset. And now they are controlling you. But I'm here to tell you and the whole purpose of this message today is to give you an answer and say to you that I, I want to say to you, if you've been violated, I want to tell you today and give you a, 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 a hope today to know that you don't have to let that violation continue into the being of who you are and whose you are. They might have violated your flesh. They might have violated your body, but they don't have to violate the way you think and your emotions and your spirit or your will. And that's the power of the gospel. It's the power of the Lord Jesus of who we serve is that he has made available to us a power that brings healing to those who've been violated. It is the power of the gospel that lets you know that you are loved and you have not been rejected. You have not been turned aside. You have not been held accountable. God does not hold though violated has a, a responsible for somebody else's actions. It's important that you understand that God, the Lord Jesus himself, makes available to us healing. And it's important to let the person know who did the violation, that there is a there is a power in the gospel. To help you find forgiveness and to change your behavior. I suspect that if you violated one person, you'll violate others. And perhaps maybe some of you are here today and you haven't just violated one. You have probably 
more than likely violated a multitude of people. But the power of the gospel lets us know that there's hope and deliverance. That's the power of what Jesus did for us on the cross. The power of Calvary is this. The power of putting your trust in the Lord Jesus is he washes us and cleanses us. The power of it is he heals us. The blood that Jesus shed on Calvary heals us from all of our sickness, all of our problems, all of our pain, all of our hurt. The blood of Jesus heals us from all of that. And I've got great news for you today. Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood and his blood is available to you right now. Hallelujah. I want to challenge you today. I want to encourage you today. I want to speak to you today. Say to you, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners who plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilt and stain. We can help you today. I want to invite you to make a phone call. I want to invite you to call that number on the screen right, right now. I want to urge you today to hit that, send that email. Maybe you're, you're watching this broadcast and watching this message at an odd hour, maybe in the middle of the night, maybe in a, at, at a time when the, when the church may not even be open. But guess what? You can email us and we will get back to you. We will reach out to you if you reach out to us. You need ministry, we will provide that ministry for you. Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood on the cross, and we can put our trust in what he did and what he said because he did what nobody else did, what Muhammad and Buddha and Confucius and all the others, Harry Christians, none of them did what Jesus did. He did what nobody else did. He got up out of the grave. I was having a discussion with somebody recently. I said, well, why, how, why and how can you say that Jesus is the only way? Because he said he's the only way. He said he's the way, the truth, and the life. That's why we can put our trust in him. And he did what nobody else did. He got up out of the grave. It is a fact. He conquered death. Nobody else conquered death. That's what sets him apart from everybody else. He conquered death. And not only did he conquer death, he'll conquer whatever it is that has entrapped you and burdened you and wore you out. He will conquer it in your life. I invite you to come and make that choice and make that decision in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I thank you today that you made provisions for the Tamars of today to be cleansed, to be free, to be healed. You made it possible, Father, for them to be covered by the blood. Help them to receive that today in Jesus' name. You have made it possible for the descendants of Amnon, for the relatives of Amnon, for those who are walking in Amnon's plight, flight and path, to be freed and forgiven. And I pray that you would make that happen this day, almighty God, in the precious and mighty name of Jesus the Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Be blessed. I love you with the love of the Lord. Have a great day and a marvelous week. God bless you. Good morning and praise the Lord, family. Come on, turn up the computers wherever you are. You might be at home, but your praise can still reach Jesus. Let's turn it up one time. Come on. Say you are. blessing that he has in store for me I receive I'm waiting for my harvest it's coming